going to call the meeting to order. I do apologize for having to change the time, but the chancellor um, last night called a nine o'clock meeting for citywide, all principals, superintendents, and and central staff. So, um, so I apologize, and I didn't want to um, exclude people uh, that were mandated to be on that call. Um, so, just a couple of, of quick announcements before we start with um, the minutes is that. Um, I want to introduce our newest member of DLT, which is our DPAC representative, and that is Taylor O'Brien. Welcome, Taylor. Um, for those of you who sat on the CEC a few years ago, Joe and Christine, you remember Taylor. She was our student rep. Um, on the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you know what? I love that she was impressed by now I feel Karen's very leadership. Old. Yeah, I'm sorry. leadership, and now she has come back to to lead as a parent in our district. So always love that, and thank you, Taylor, for being here. Um, you know, it was very funny because when I told Mr. McAuliffe that Taylor was the DPAC rep, he goes, "Oh, I need to talk to her. I have to spend that one percent." So, gosh, you'll be happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's already happened in place. So make sure you meet with Mr. McAuliffe also. Um, well, and then Taylor. Yep, and, and then Brooke Sturgeon is the alternate um, PAC rep. So welcome, Brooke, and you know you are a um, recognized parent leader in the community as well. So welcome and thank you guys for being here. So um, today after the meeting, because I know you guys were both um, you know wanting to come on and and um, you know uh, see how the DLTs work. I don't know about either of your schedules. So Taylor as the rep. Um, if this time works for you, um, and, and we'll make sure you have all the dates, then um, you would be the rep. And then, Brooke, you could always come on as a guest because DLTs are public meetings. Um, or, Taylor, if this time doesn't work well for you, you can just nominate Brooke. And if, Brooke, um, the time works for you, um, then that's how it would be. Or you guys can you know, continue to come together. But for consensus purposes and just uh, decision-making at the um, DLT level, very similar to SLT, only one of you could be that person. Right, but the more the merrier, all is welcome. Um, and welcome to the DLT. And I am so excited that we finally got our packs up and running. Gus, we should get some sort of certificate. Christine, <laughs> and you can give it to Christine. It has taken over a year and a half, but we finally got it. We have all of our schools have packs, and I don't know if Esther's on, um, but uh, Esther, yeah. thank you guys. We have all of our schools have packs that have um that are title one. Um, and our elections are complete and we are up and running. So Christine, thank you. You will continue to thank you. support Taylor. Um, and Taylor, yes. you just let uh, Christine know when you're, you know, when you're like, Christine, I'm good. But, you know, I know I always uh, started any new job with a mentor. So, um, you know, she'll be there to, to uh, support you and ask questions. So now Christine um, uh, will officially be uh, the local elected representative on the DLT. So she is, um, you know, coming here as a guest and a support as well over the next couple of um, meetings for Taylor. So Gus, um, the uh, one question, we have another question actually that I'm going to let Taylor email to you. Um, the question was, as they establish PAC bylaws, can they make the election two Can years see this? Or, do, or does it have to um, be yearly? Well, uh, you know, um, the best practice is always uh, to email me and I'll um, email um, our, you know, PAC expert at Central and okay. get an answer in writing uh, because, uh, you know, it's still relatively new. And by the way, don't put it in the minutes, but um, I, my feeling is that Queens North is number one in the city in terms of getting uh, PACs uh, together and, uh, and getting all of this done uh, in um, uh, a professional. And Put it in the minutes. Put it in Esther, the minutes. you and I make a great team. <laughs> <team. laughs> because I haven't done a survey, but that's my, uh, uh, that's my impression. And uh, I've been following the emails back and forth. And that's why, we, you know, so many uh, questions come from my, uh, my districts because they're so much ahead of everybody else that they need guidance uh, in, you know, implementing the details. Wait, most important, are we ahead of 26? That's what we need to know. 
Well, they, they I'm had a title one school. Twenty six is largely non Title one. Oh, yes. okay. We're ahead, of them. We're ahead of them. That's it. We're ahead of them. I'm with you, Lewis. We're number and one. Very small Look number. At Joe, he's like very calmly saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> so, um, no, Joe. The only, I mean, that's us. The only reason I ask that is, um, is because Taylor and Brooke have to put together the bylaws right for their first pack meeting. So, um. So Taylor, uh, if you look back at the email that I sent, Gus has a Demetrio. Just shoot him. I'm gonna him put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, and and just um, Taylor, always CC me as well, only because we're in a learning phase, right? So any so any question that you ask would be new for me as well. So so just feel free to anytime you email Gus, kind of put me in there so the answer can be shared and we'll all have that same information. Can you add me too, Brooke? Um, Taylor, thank you. Uh, oh, Lewis, so did, you, did you uh, put out a signature sheet for this meeting? I don't see one yet. Because it's on the website, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat also. Yep. Because I got, and I have two things. As we are on the topic of bylaws, the uh, D25 President Council is in the process of revising and amending the bylaws, and I'm glad you said email is the best practice so we emailed you um this morning about the questions that came through to us talking to different PAC members and chairperson so it's in your inbox for your uh verification already, yeah, already sent the central yeah, gus sent that to me as well so oh i did not cc you on it no no oh sorry uh, yeah I the follow-up that i sent was this so in chances regs it says that um, President's Council can nominate um, somebody to represent them on President's uh, the President's Council. The president of a PTA can nominate someone from President's Council to represent them on President's Council, right? So, so we currently have a member on our school board who it was is not a PTA president. She was nominated by the president of the PTA to represent the school on President's right. Council. So, so the question that I put in is. Um, if that does that eliminate a PTA president from selecting a PAC rep to be their their um, uh, their representative? Because um, the answer to that will determine whether or not you can even put that in your bylaws. Because because technically, if you have that in your bylaws and Central says that a PTA president can nominate anyone they want. Um, then then putting that in your bylaws would be in violation of of the chancellor's regulations and you can't have bylaws that are in violation of that. no that's fine that's fine the, as yeah. as as this is pack is so new and it's evolving and like brooke and taylor uh, are going to actually start writing and revising bylaws so this is something that a lot of people were talking and in, this is all brainstorming so they were talking from the perspective that when at school level, when PTA president and PAC person cannot be the same, like for PS24, we have for last two years, we have had two people distinguished for PAC and for PTA sitting on SLT. So mm -hmm. PS24 has been doing that the last two years. So at school level, when those two positions cannot be held by one person. So when we were talking, somebody said that will be a circular reference, right? Because if if I am a PTA president of my school and I, I cannot go to president council and I nominate a PAC chair, this is how this question came out. Somebody said, I'm a PTA president and can I nominate my PAC chair person to sit on president council? If I say yes, then the person sits and then that person if gets can get elected and on the seat but then the question can but if pta and pac cannot be the same person i should not be allowed to nominate the pac chair person to sit on president council i should be able to nominate any other person because that title is already taken so yeah, that, I don't know that's, that's how this all started right that's yeah. how this whole started then then a, then a PAPT at a district level will be the PAC person who will be controlling that but then at the school level it's different so there were so many issues and started coming so we said unless we start and putting that in writing and asking nobody will be like we will not be able to understand what's the like right. what but, but but the thing is what what chances reg says is that any representative with approval of president's council can run for president no no i i know that's you you are absolutely right so that's, that's when everybody started to say like 
do you think even that needs to get maybe do you think that is in the process of getting amended because now PAC is becoming PAC and PT are becoming two independent entities of parent body where funding is involved one is a federal funding one one is a parent fund funding so if there is getting a distinct line between those two do you think people are thinking so let's just put our thoughts on paper put it out because if there is in the process of changing stuff at least they know what parents and what are the questions so it's it's all about asking the questions in the right time so if there is there is something that's being done. So these are the questions that the parents at school level are asking or thinking. So, so um, that up. So uh, two things. So so we know that PAC does not represent all of the schools in the district, right? Because it only rep represents Title One schools, right? Um, and we also know that um, you know we all work together in collaboration. Um, but you know there there is. There has always been um, the expectation of a subcommittee because they wanted a group of parent leaders to work separate and apart from from DLT, from PTA, just a, around that discussion. So, um, so I'm sure that President's Council will work alongside of the parent leaders of the PAC. Um, but you know, I mean, look, we also have situations where you know, years ago, you could not be, um, you could not run for CEC if you held. Right. Certain, right. But so, yeah. so now there's, right. there's nothing to say. We'll, we'll wait to hear from Central, but right. I right. don't, you know, one of the things that we constantly talk about is you cannot put in your bylaws something that is uh, opposite of what the Chancellor's regulation is saying. So if the Chancellor's regulation does not change that, um, you know, where it says that, in agreement with the council, a nominee can run. If that's not changed, then I wouldn't even put that in your bylaws. And you would just say like, this person is a PAC rep and also wants to run from president and, and run it up as a vote for, you know, the council, see what they say. If the council is opposed to it, then the council is opposed to it. If not, they're not. Right. So, you know, I mean, I wouldn't, yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, all right, so before we uh, go into the minutes, the next piece that I wanted to say is that the chancellor announced today that they will be reopening middle schools as of February 25th, which is exciting for us. Um, and um, a couple of things, teachers will return the 24th to make sure that schools are um, ready to welcome our middle school students back. And then the 25th is the day that students will begin. So that's some exciting news. And um, as you know, that we've been working as a district to ensure that all of our middle schools are ready and prepared to go back five days a week. So we're gonna do one final um, check for the pulse to make sure that that's happening. Most of our schools said that that is possible. Um, and Dr. Mike and I will to continue to support our parents over the next I mean, our parents, our schools over the next week and a half to make sure that all of our middle schools can go back five days. Right now, all our K to eights are ready to go back five days. Some of our larger middle schools are ready to go back five days. Um, and um, most of our smaller middle schools, such as 379 and Bell Academy, I have to double check Bell Academy is ready to go back five days. So, um, so we will follow up with you guys. But for right now, just know that we are all on the path to have all of our middle schools um, open five days. So um, any questions? Yeah, kind of what Christine was putting in the chat. Uh, is there an op opportunity for the parents that have their kids remote to opt back in or is that out the door still? So here's the thing. Um, I want to be clear that there is a process by which a parent can request for their case to be reviewed to come back into school. Um, but one of the reasons why I think they did the final opt-in period is because they wanted all of the blended parents to have an opportunity. If they're choosing their students to be um, in school, they wanted to give them as many days as possible. So once we've done, we did that, um, each parent can make a request to their school principal. Their school principal does two things. They review the request because you can't just say, oh, I want my kid back into school five days a week. There has to be a reason why. Um, and then that request comes to me 
if and only if the if the school has room, because there are some schools that may not have room now for for health and safety reasons. So if the if the re reason is a legitimate reason, case by case basis, that's why I'm not going to mention any of them. Um, and there's room in the school, then that is something that we will consider. But um, in some cases, we have had parents in the elementary schools asked to come back and there's no more room left in the school. So what do we tell the community if they ask? It's case by case and don't give out the details? I would, tell, I would tell the community to contact their principal because there is that process. Um, some of them we've been able to approve, some of them we have not, you know, so um, so that's that's where I would leave that. Um, any other questions, concerns? Oh, Lamar, go ahead. You, you just unmute yourself. Yeah, I forgot I unmuted myself. Hi, good morning. Is there any um, talk? I know this news just came out. So is there any talk about how the weekly testing factors into schools reopening? Would you know at all about whether or not the 20% testing could still hold in place? So they did talk about that uh, this morning. They're going to give us more information. But what I can tell you is it's been very successful um, in our elementary schools. Um, and they plan to continue to use the same process, um, you know, because there has been some concerns around cases in District 25. We are like the district that they come to um, on a weekly basis and it's working well. So our principals are, are aware of, of what to do in regard to testing. Um, you know, we're going to continue to encourage parents um, before we start to fill out the um you know, the, the consent forms, they're in a place right now with parent consent forms where if a parent doesn't fill out the consent form, we first start talking with guidance, you know, in terms of guiding them in order to talk about the importance of testing, but then we move them to remote if a parent continuously refuses. So, so those uh, systems are all in place um, and I don't foresee it being a problem for the, the random testing to happen. Okay. Um, all right, so Lewis, if you can, can you put up the um, minutes and, and the agenda for today and, and we can go through them? Do you want the minutes or the agenda? Well, first put the agenda so we can, and then we'll do the minutes. Thank you. So I already did the first part. Okay. So, so just so you know, uh, uh, as you're reading this, I don't know if you hear my daughter screaming now that she knows that she's quarantined. No, we can't hear it. <laughs> we can't hear it. Oh boy, my daughter was in a class. Her cheer team. Somebody got coronavirus, and I. I didn't even tell her. I just told my husband to tell her she's quarantined because she's scared. Her yeah. life's over. Her life is over. <laughs> okay, if you could put the minutes up. Minutes. Where are you? Minutes. Minutes. I got too many windows open. All right. So here are the minutes from Monday, February 8th. Monday, January 11th. February 8th is today. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. That's today's date. The 11th, January 11th. And just for the record, I sent these so everyone has them as well. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> She's still yelling. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, what happened, Lewis? Oh, there you go. Sorry, sorry. This is the bottom of it. All right, so if someone, when, if anybody's ready, if I can have a motion in a second to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Thank you, Joe. Can I get a second? I second. Thank you, Mary. Okay, so, um, so first and foremost, um, Gus, if you don't mind, can you present first? Um, because mine is um, going to take a little while. So sure. In yeah. fact, um, you know, uh, the DLT members will be happy to hear that I'll be especially brief today. Uh, I basically have updates on my uh, items. Uh, the DCP. Um, uh, Mike uh, and I have been collaborating on uh, the DCP all along. Uh, the DLT members have given their input. I expect that um, there are still some refinements that we need to put in um, in the uh, action plans uh, and uh, we'll be good to go and uh, go for approval, uh, formal approval next month. Uh, and as I indicated, we will be, uh, I will be sending out another DocuSign, these pleasant DocuSign uh, emails and documents for the sign off on the DCEP. I've seen um, the, uh, the draft of the new one. Uh, and uh, as happens every year, once we complete uh, the current one, uh, we uh, automatically begin working on the new one for next academic year. The, the new one will be a full DCP with all the relevant parts uh, and it will be on iPlan as in the past. Uh, I don't uh, know exactly when we're going to get that, but I suspect it'll happen uh, within um, probably um, March or um, April. So. Um, we will have it to begin working on uh, the DCP again. Um, any questions on DCP, folks? And I uh, thank you all I, for your work. I, I just want to announce um, uh, Esther and Jin May sent the the parent and family engagement policy, the 100.11 plan. We sent that to translation. They said we should have it by the end of the month. So. Right, so then we'll be sending that to all PAC reps, all schools, and, and then uh, President's Council for them to uh, present it to the, the parents as well. Uh, that actually brings up uh, an, um, uh, something uh, that is part of the DCP. 
the 100.11 plan. As you know, um, uh, the 100.11 plan is usually reviewed every other year based on the survey that um, uh, Central sends out uh, to SLTs. You, to my knowledge, you're the only district who has who taken individual district initiative to check on uh, your SLTs utilizing the survey that the superintendent's going to talk about, which is very commendable. So um, uh, I, I, it's your decision uh, as to whether you want to use that information to update your 100.11 plan uh, uh, or wait uh, until the, uh, the, the central and the rest of the city uh, you know, uh, does it in a um, formal way, utilizing the uh, face uh, sent survey as they have in the past. That, that's another piece that's totally up to you. Uh, I don't think that um, uh, uh, there's anything preventing uh, an update, and then you could update it again once uh, Central does uh, its uh, uh, survey as well. Uh, so that that'll leave uh, as a as a discussion point uh, when um, the superintendent presents the results of the survey. Um, on the um, uh, uh, DCIP and uh, and uh, consolidated plan signatures. Uh, this has been uh, a uh, interesting task. Um, I've been collecting emails back and forth who has signed and who hasn't. Uh, we still have outstanding uh, signatures for both documents from District um, uh, 25. Uh, just before this meeting, I sent out, uh, I figured out how to, how to use DocuSign to resend a, a reminder um, to um, those who have not signed on the DCIP document. I know that it worked because Esther uh, immediately signed and I got a, uh, uh, a uh, response that uh, she signed. So um, that's a process, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you'll be getting reminders from me. At some point, I will put it to bed and whatever signatures I have, uh, I will have. But again, our reputation is stellar. We have always, you know, had uh, all of the necessary signatures and have been, you know, complete. Um, so, um, oh, thank you. I see somebody else signed as well. So, you know, it's an ongoing process and one that I uh, will uh, keep on top of. And as I said, then I'll, I I'm going to have a third document, the DCIP signature page, to run after soon. Uh, and um, uh, if you can appreciate. Um, the the, um, the task because uh, I've got three different documents with multiple signatures just for District 25, but I also have to worry about three other districts, uh, so some of whom have more DLT members than you. So it's a it's a it's it's a piece with a lot of moving parts, but uh, we'll get it all done. It's all good. Um, now the SLT webinar um, and. Um, uh, the CEP signature pages. The SLT webinar, um, I believe I sent out uh, to the superintendent's office a list of some schools that had not done the uh, attestation. Remember the way it's supposed to work. And um, this was messaged in December to all schools. The SLTs were supposed to view the training webinar together uh, at the, I guess it's only the uh, January meeting that they could do that or um, you know if that um, meeting um, they needed a special meeting they could do that remotely as well and then the principal was supposed to uh, attest uh, to central that this was done uh, so uh, you were pretty good you didn't have a lot of schools but there were some and I'm sure that uh, the district office will you know remind uh, those that haven't done it and when I get another update from central That'll all be done. Um, the CEP signature pages for uh, SLTs. That is another interesting um, uh, task uh, if you go the DocuSign route. Uh, just as a reminder, schools have three choices. They can either uh, uh, scan and upload um, the uh, signature page, get the signatures by people who have you know, access to parents who can actually sign, um, and then um, uh, upload the document in a in the traditional way. They can use down. Um, they can use DocuSign, 
uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, to uh, get the signatures, or they can email SLT members, collect those, uh, those signatures and um, uh, those email signatures, and then upload them into um, uh, iPlan. All of this is being done uh, via iPlan, folks. Now, um, two things have happened. One, uh, initially, we found that there was not enough capacity in iPlan uh, for the uh, PDFs, those are those electronic documents, uh, uh, to be uploaded. So, uh, you know, I went back and forth. Finally, what, um, what uh, uh, Central did was to increase the capacity um, of uploading documents. So now this should not be a problem. And by the way, because I've interacted with a lot of principals on this, principals need to understand that the way they do it, and they go to the, not their goals, not their action plans, they go to the third box down where it says SLT Builder, I think, and then they go into that, and that's where they upload the, uh, the uh, SLT. So um, I also discovered the following in interacting with principals and schools, that um, the instructions which I've sent out and I continue to send out to people from Central about using DocuSign for, S for school SLT signatures uh, requires the principal to get an account. So principals go on the instructions, they click on the link uh, to you know establish an account, and the language is not the best there. Um, it, um, it, 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 it should be a little clearer, and I suggested that to Central. But once they click on that, they don't get the account right away. Um, and uh, Central, I think, is going to message this. Um, it takes up to 48 hours for the principal to get that account and be able to do this. And principals do not receive at the present time an email from, from DocuSign that they have to have an account. So principals have to understand that uh, it doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes time. And what they need to do is keep checking uh, back to see whether uh, doc, the DocuSign account ha has been enabled giving them access to this. It's a new system, folks. Like everything new, uh, there are always um, uh, complications, and um, we're working them out. Uh, and as always, anything related to CEPs, uh, schools, um, uh, email principals, email me 24-7, and I'm always um, uh, available to support them and help uh, sort out any needs and problems on an individual uh, school basis. Um, the CEPs, the timeline, which I think I've sent out again uh, numerous times, the deadline was the first. Um, the um, CEPs are all in the process now of being uh, reviewed and certified by the superintendent. Um, there are some, uh, a small number of missing pieces to some of them, and I've interacted with the uh, district office on those missing pieces, and I'm sure they're going to be fixed. And as I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I never tire of saying, um, you're always number one or number two or number three in the entire city in getting all of this done. And I'm proud of the fact uh, that my districts are at the top of the city. So when the update comes on CP completion and, C, uh, and superintendent certifications, I'm sure that we'll be at 100% or close to 100%. And I expect a report to come out um, now, on the uh, Title I in PACs, we've um, uh, just spoken about that at the beginning of the meeting. Um, there were, uh, a, again, a very small number of uh, schools that had done the uh, uh, PAC um, recognition piece where, you know, they, they go in and do the survey and attest the principal attests that the PAC is in place, the Title I meeting has been taking place, etc. Um, the reason for the complication for that, and um, believe me, I've gone back and forth with a lot of schools on this, is that unfortunately uh, some schools confused the, um, the, the PAC related survey from Central with a very similar looking survey from FACE. And so they, they, they complete the uh, FACE survey and they think they've done the PAC one. Um, again, that's not a big issue in your district 
because um, I think you're you're at 100 percent or close to it. But um, uh, it is a, a, a issue uh, citywide. And the only way I discover this is when I get a screenshot of what they actually filled, filled out. Uh, and then um, we can recognize that it is a different looking survey. Um, any questions on anything I've said so far? That that uh, completes my um, my uh, presentation for today. Oh, actually, one more thing. Um, uh, Bill Doyle is on the call. Uh, we have um, uh, a uh, TSI visit for Flushing High School scheduled right after the break. Uh, Bill, you can remind me of the date if um, uh, because I, I don't have it here in front of me. Uh, and um, uh, we're actually going to set up a pre uh, meeting with the uh, principal um, uh, uh, this week, uh, maybe as soon as tomorrow. Uh, we already have one scheduled with Bryan High School. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, virtual visit will uh, also um, uh, have uh, some classroom visits as well. And um, we, uh, I'm also working with Flushing. Uh, Ignacio, I've been um, interacting with him and his team about a, um, a school improvement grant a SIG um, uh, report that's due uh, and um, uh, that will be completed uh, for his school as well. Now I'm done. So, yeah, Gus, I just wanted to piggyback on that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so the Flushing TSI visit will be Thursday, the 25th at 10 a.m. That, that's the date for the Flushing visit. Thank you, Bill. Um, so Will, I'm hoping that, um, uh, when would you get, uh, is there a write-up or any sort of documentation about visits like that? Uh, for this one, there will be, uh, a, um, uh, a, um, a write-up. Uh, we don't have consultants on these visits anymore. So, uh, between Bill and myself, I'll be the primary, um, you know, recorder. We will write up a brief overview of that visit. But actually, we have been um, keeping notes on the previous visit. There are four of them. Uh, the purpose, the, the main focus of these two first ones are uh, uh, CP, action plans, progress monitoring, et cetera. Uh, the third and fourth uh, really are oriented towards the new CP and how the school is making progress. Um, no, the only reason I say that is that you know that the uh, the DLT asks for progress of flushing because they are um, the school that keeps us um, not in, I mean, we're a district in good standing, but it's, it's, uh, there's a state, I would say, like sort of accountability hit towards the district because of flushing. So um, if you could, and I don't know if this is something that's public, if you could kind of present to us any sort of updates about Flushing and their progress. Well, now we have Bill Doyle, who is the uh, director of school improvement for um, uh, Superintendent Lindsay's team as part of the DLT. So uh, he plays a integral part in not only these um, periodic uh, uh, TSI visits, uh, but uh, he interacts with the school on, a, I would say, a, a weekly basis. So. Um, uh, Bill, uh, do you want to schedule something in at some point in the uh, near future uh, on, uh, you know, Flushing High School progress? Absolutely. Um, Superintendent Domingo, if, if you want, what I can do is, uh, I don't have all that information in front of me now, but I can definitely put together for the next DLT um, how they're meeting those benchmarks, what's happening at the school, things of that nature. Would that, that would be uh, yeah. helpful for these meetings. Yes, thank you. That would yeah, be I can do that. Not a problem. OK, perfect. perfect. How much time would you uh, want me to uh, take? Um, you let us know uh, what you uh, what your presentation would would entail. It's it's okay. because I do know that the progress of flushing is something that we um, every time we review our data or seeing accountability, you know, is released. Flushing does come up as an area of concern for uh, the district. So if we can um, just review that. Absolutely. For, Yep, and for our new um, DLT members, so we know that the city is broken up very differently than uh, state accountability metrics. 
Um, and one of the reasons why the DLT um, is organized in the way it is, is because the state still sees District 25 as a K-12 district, even though the city um, organizes districts by K-8, to um, which is one area, and then high schools, which is a different area. But we as a DLT kind of bring all of that together. And I know that in the past, the CEC has really worked for... Um, for some uh, district collaboration in the K-12 model. I know that uh, Joseph Benedetto spent a lot of time working with the principal of Flushing, and so did Christine Coniglio, um, just around um, forming collaborations. Uh, I believe 379 and Flushing have a collaboration, um, and that Joe really wanted um, the, the District 25 community to have an opportunity to um, to understand, you know, what flushing is and and the things that they offer to students. So, um, Christine, you just did you say yes that that was that you that says that who's that says that? Uh, Sorry, yes, yes. Uh, Three seventy nine has a relationship with flushing, and they did a lot of um, well pre COVID. There was interacting between the the two schools and getting the kids. Um, to speak to people from Flushing, et cetera. There were more plans um, to actually get the kids into Flushing, like on a on a field trip kind of a thing. But, you know, then the pandemic happened. Yeah. OK. I mean, look, I think we I think we put in to get some good systems, at least or some, some good relationships that we should continue to do that. That that is a beautiful campus. It is a local yeah. campus. And we wanted our. Um, you know, our parents and, and students in the district to really have an opportunity to see what, what the, and there's three schools on that campus to really see what um, the Flushing campus is about. So we'll continue to, to do that as well. So Joe, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything. Yeah, about I just wanted to say that in the past, uh, Flushing unfortunately had a bad reputation, right? Parents really don't understand and it may be old stuff. So I just wanted to bring Flushing High School to the forefront to see that, look, it, it's unwarranted. He, the, the principal there is doing a great job and they are improving and we need to get out of that, oh, my child's not going to Flushing High School mentality because it really, it's just settled in from the past and it really should not apply. Um, and I just hope that the community understands that and we can change the outlook of a beautiful high school. Yeah, so- Can so I ask a question? I'm sorry. Sure, go ahead. Um, so just out of curiosity, when when they print the high school books, right, and they put um, that information about, I know how many kids graduate and then how many kids feel safe in the in the buildings, where does that data come from? Because that was something that came up just to, you know, when we were looking through the high school book, Flushing's data still shows a very low percentage of kids feel safe in the building. Now, having walked the halls, having spur, spoke with the principal on several occasions and speaking to students, Joe and I sat and spoke to students and we did not get that impression at all. They felt very safe in the building. So that data was really conflicting to what's actually going on. And I was wondering where that data comes from. Do we know? So, Will, um, uh, I don't know if you wanted to, to speak to that. I, I know that the data of being safe in the building comes directly from the school survey. And those are the yeah. answers of the students that take the school survey. So, I mean, that's um, something that we, you know, we could talk to the principal around how he's promoting student understanding of that. I mean, we had this conversation before as a DLT that, you know, if you put, you know, all the time or some of the times on that survey, you put some yeah, of the times yeah. it, you know, it knocks you down. So, so we can, we can talk to them just in terms of. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was below, I, I, I can't remember offhand, but I believe it was below 70%. I, I don't remember. I just know that when Frankie and I were going through it, of course I was pushing for flushing. And one of the things that he caught on to right away was no, X amount of people don't feel safe in the building. And that was one thing that my son was looking at when he was looking for high school. So, and I kept saying, yeah, but that's not accurate, Frankie. The, the building's safe. I've been there. Mr. Ignat, you know, does a great job. It's a good build. And he was like, nope, the survey must say that it's not safe. Kids don't feel safe. So that was something that, you know, I definitely think should be looked into for, on for flushing, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just want to remind the, uh, the DLT of something uh, from the past. Uh, in the past, we've actually had the principle of flushing present at the DLT and uh, answer questions and uh, talk about uh, the initiatives taking place uh, uh, in the building. So uh, uh, you've done it in the past. You might want to consider doing it again in the future. Yep. I don't want to speak for uh, Dr. Accardi, but I do know that uh, he's worked really hard um, over the last few years to turn the image of flushing around. And like uh, Superintendent Domango said, uh, the survey results are, are generally, you know, right, that's coming from the students. Um, but I've walked on that campus all the time and I've always felt safe. Um, and I'm sure that Dr. Accardi would definitely want to have an opportunity to explain to parents uh, especially junior high parents that are, you know, potentially choosing flushing, that he would want to have his say and kind of explain, um, you know, a lot of the initiatives that he's put into the building to improve it. Yeah. So if you'd so like, I, I could, if you want to have a month when uh, Dr. Accardi could come in, let me know and I can, we can arrange that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be not, great. Not too. He's, yeah. He's spoken to the DLT before, so it would be great if you can, you know, maybe at the same time, uh, Bill, if he could do it next month, you know, or I can, I can uh, let me check with his schedule, but yeah, probably this... we'll we'll make it because it's yeah, important. Perfect. Yeah, no, perfect. I, I also know that, um, you know, even myself in terms of school surveys, you know, I'll when I, when I go to do a school visit for a principal, I ask to speak with a group of students. And very often I'll use the school survey. Now I pick some of the students and the principal picks some of the students. So it's a random selection. Um, and very often I will talk about negative school survey results and the students will say, well, no, that's not really how, um, how it is. So I think that's um, important to know too that um, I don't, historically, our middle schoolers don't always have the best things to say about their schools. <laughs> Having had some middle schoolers and high schoolers, <laughs> I don't know if they would. I mean, it's definitely something we should look into, sort of like the accuracy of how students are answering these questions, how they feel. We want to make sure that it's it's truly reflective of how they feel about their school. So, um, but but I see very similar data in my conversations with students um, across all schools, because if I see negative data, even in a particular question, I'll go right there. And and most of the time, um, you know, kids are like, no, no, we don't necessarily feel that way. So, um, okay. So Gus, uh, your, your presentation has concluded, yes? Yes, I, and I thought I was gonna be brief. All right, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, actually, also just for sake of time, um, Janine, do you have an update for uh, yes. high school? Yes, in fact, I do. Um, Lewis, I sent it. If you don't mind sharing it, I had emailed it to you. If not, I can share it. Um, just, just two slides. I mean, you could did you send it to me. I don't know. Yeah, I uh, I emailed it to you. When? Uh, this morning before the meeting. Let me see. Janine, do you want me oh, to share my screen? I have it. Oh, sure. Well, that would be great. Thank you. OK. Oh, um, Does everyone see it? Yep. Yep. Hold on. No, I don't see it. There we go. OK. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so just a few updates for uh, Superintendent Lindsay regarding uh, the D25 high schools. Um, so all of the CEPs were approved by Superintendent Lindsay. Uh, the secondary schools, and those are the six through eight schools under Superintendent Lindsay, are preparing for five days of instruction. Uh, I can attest to that personally that we've been working hard to do that. And uh, Kelly Johnson for, from um, the Global School for the Baccalaureate School for Global Education is also she's actually not D25. So uh, sorry about that. But yes, we are preparing. Um, rigorously for that for the return of our students. High schools are in the process of completing NX grades. The date is the due date for NX grades is February 10th. Once grades are completed, the final NX report will become available and schools may submit an appeal. And that was a relatively new uh, decision 
that they're extending the NX appeal if families are experiencing uh, an extraordinarily difficult circumstance that they can be extended even further. So the NX are the grades up that are in progress because there are no um, failing grades per se. Um, if an NX is resolved, then the student can get a grade. If the NX is not resolved, an, an NC will, will uh, go on the transcript, not a failing grade. Uh, the D25 assistant principal's critical friends group is uh, in session and it allows for the AP um, to form and investigate a problem of practice using an inquiry lens. So they go on um, the, the CFC groups, social studies and science. In our particular case, our APs visit other schools. Um, they come up with a collective problem of practice and then a problem of practice that's unique to the school. They go into classes um, using a protocol, and then they support each other in exploring the problem of practice. Uh, D25 schools will begin the relaunch of My Brother's Keeper, uh, which was really flourishing before we um, had to shut down. Uh, February through April, these activities will start. They're going to range from leadership skills to SEL, social, social justice and civics engagement. And um, there's also a new mindfulness wellness initiative starting on February 9th. We had our first one with um, Barnaby Spring last week or the week before, and this is now going to become an ongoing support uh, for principals to help them to deal with stress. And that is it. Thank you, Janine. Um, okay, so I just wanna go over a couple of things while Lewis pulls up. Um, the survey that I had sent to you guys on Thursday. Um, so in conjunction with what Superintendent Lindsay had reported, um, District 25, all of our CEPs are approved as well. Um, Gus, do we know when they're gonna be pulled and put up on school websites? The information on the timeline is that this will be done on a rolling basis. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure exactly you know what that means. Um, it, I do expect to get a, um, a survey from Central, a completion survey and superintendent certification survey. So I assume when that comes out, then they'll start posting them. Uh, and, um, you know, I'll give you more information uh, on that as I get it. I actually have a meeting with um, Sharon Rencher and uh, Central uh, at four o'clock today. So I'll ask that question. OK, perfect. Um, in addition, our MBK activities are beginning as well. So we have budgeted for two activities that um, were aligned to our plan. Our first is um, offering training to, I believe, Mike, what is it now? Seven schools, eight schools? Yeah, that's correct around um, culturally responsive curriculum and instruction. They're going to be working with Maria Akignell, who um, has worked with the district before, um, and teams of uh, staff members across these eight schools will be really unpacking their units of study and looking at the resources um, you know, that are within a unit to make sure that we're addressing uh, multiple perspectives and um, the different cultures and communities that are represented across District 25, right? We are a diverse community, um, and it is one of the things that we want to make sure that our students are exposed to um, just, just a, a wide range of, of world perspectives. So, so she's going to be doing that work. That starts actually tomorrow. Tomorrow. Correct? Yep. Um, and then we are also normally what we had used our MBK money was for a summer program for our youngest readers, K to two, K to three, um, in terms of the goal of having all students reading on grade level by third grade. Um, because, of course, we couldn't do that um, let this past summer. We're going to do it in very small um, MTSS groups. Uh, we had sent out a posting for teachers, and we have how many people applied, Mike? Uh, right now, we have four and a supervisor. Yeah, Lamar, put that out there. Did you get the, can you, Mike, can you send, um, 
uh, Lamar the posting so he can put that out there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. No problem. Sure. Just just to offer it uh, to to more teachers because um, the money has to be spent by April. So we're planning on starting this uh, March, first week, right? First week in March. March. Yep. So, um, and so it's, it really is what uh, we described in terms of MTSS, a cycle of learning, right? Where they do intensive skill-based reading supports. I think the thing that might be turning everyone off and we hope not for the students too, is it's three days a week. And one of those days is a Saturday. Um, so, so it's, but it's only an hour and a half, right? So it's, two small groups during the week and then bringing one that that group together for a larger group but still no more than you know 10 or 11 kids but you know to kind of just give that that last minute push so we can um but but there's there's money that needs to be spent so um if teachers are interested then we're happy to have them um okay no problem okay so i'm i'm looking at mike's face he's sending it to you as we speak yes okay um all right, any questions about MBK before we go on? All right, so before we, uh, actually we can think about this uh, following the survey, but there was two things. So the 100.11 plan that we normally do following the biennial survey is really about, um, and Gus, correct me if I'm wrong, it's really about SLT health. I don't know why I have this big thing on my head. It's really about SLT health and um, what we as a district believe in just around supporting SLT health, correct, Gus? Correct. So, SLT uh, health, by the way, is my term. Yeah. It's not oh, it's, an official term. There you go. So I yeah. like that, SLT health. So, so one of the things that I was thinking we could do, I mean, we can all decide to come to a consensus and work on the 100.11 plan. And Dr. D'Antone and I will be happy to do that with you and then present it at following meetings. Um, but I also wanted to come up with a document because the 100.11 plan is very standardized. We very similar to, um, you know, uh, bylaws and and other things that come from central. It really is a, a centralized district that a centralized document that we make uh, district focused. But what I was very interested in doing for this year um, is creating a, a guidance document for our DLTs specific to District 25 based on just this data. So we could do both. After we go over the data, I'm gonna kind of revisit that question again for all of you to basically say, do you wanna do both? That's fine. Um, but I wanted it to specifically be, here's what the data that we collected shows us. And as a DLT, we unpacked it and discussed it. So, so Lewis, can you put it up there right now? And just so you guys know, if you can't follow along on the computer, I sent you the, the document um, on Thursday as well. So what I want, we wanted to do is go through question by uh, question and just see mm -hmm. if there are uh, any DLT members that have feedback on particular things. I was looking at some and, and um, there were some pretty interesting uh, data points that I saw, I will say the good thing is, is we have, a we got a very nice response and very positive responses, but that's not to say that there aren't certain things that we can improve upon. So, so, um, so let's go through that. And Danielle, okay. you can actually, if you want to progress through the slides, you can and on top. I think it says take control or something. Do you see something like that? Yep. Yep. Oh, and okay. I can do it too. Okay. Let's see if it works. Oh, did I just do that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I need to go back. Oh, here. Okay. Go back. Backward arrow. Backward, backward arrow. arrow. Okay. So this is just information that Gus was reviewing that we knew, right? So, um, and we just want to be very clear that this is not a centralized document. It is a District 25 document um, because the city, for whatever reason, we don't know, they didn't send their surveys uh, yet this year, or I don't know if they'll be sending them at all. Um, so this document and survey that we're going to go over is to really help us best support our SLTs. Um, okay, so um, these are the response, the school types that responded to us. Um, so we have 65.7% of elementary schools and 16.3% of um, our middle uh, schools. The, of the 289 responses, 65% were elementary schools, 16% were middle schools, and then it goes down from there. Didn't I just say that? <laughs> well, it's not sixty-five percent of our middle schools, of, of our elementary. Oh, sorry, schools. sorry, sixty-five percent right. elementary of responses, schools. right? Right. So, um, 
okay. So then we would say um, there was uh, most likely an equal amount of high school, elementary, and uh, our six to twelve that that um, make up the rest of the percentage. Okay, here's the constituency groups and the percentages of um, answers of those that responded to the survey. So we see almost 50% of the responses came from parents. So we're really happy to see that. 25.6 um, came from UFT and 15.9 from CSA. And then there's that small pocket of others. Mm -hmm. um, Just so everyone knows, you would see a smaller percentage of CSA normally because their representation on the team is, on. is less than others. Why yeah. anybody has any questions about the percentages that are not displayed on the screen? For example, on this screen, DC 37. Just let me know. I have the data in front of me so I can I read. I have a question. Groups. Sorry. Yeah. Why are there two groups of teachers and what is it? different from UFT? I mean, shouldn't they all be tied together? So, Dr. Mike, was this a text box that yeah, you just typed so, into? No, it was a drop down. There was an other section. So if a teacher, for whatever reason, just didn't notice the UFT button, they might have included teacher as, you know, as the other. So you'll, that's why you see the lines are so narrow, so small. Mm -hmm. It's because it's, you know, a couple of teachers might have indicated that they were a teacher and didn't click on the UFT button. Yeah, I, I can confirm. I'm looking at the data right now, and you have teachers spelled in different ways, lowercase yeah. t, uh, because of that other other box. So what what percentage is that? Just so we can add that to the twenty five point six. Um, I mean, uh, so you, yeah, you'd have to you'd have to go on a yeah. line, on a line by line. We can get that if you want, Danielle. But, but they're very, it's very they're very small amounts. Seven to. Uh, yeah, people wrote weird things. They wrote core member, they wrote SLT. Like maybe 10 teachers can be okay. added to UFT. Okay. So it's not that big of a... Okay. And as you guys can see, um, the, it changes for certain questions by maybe one or two responses. But for the most part, we have 289 responses to each of our questions. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, we broke it down by ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I know, Dr. Mike, I, I asked you to uh, talk about our data in terms of ethnicity across the district, because this is a question that I found very interesting. So can you just speak in terms of that? Yeah, so the um, our largest population in in the district is our Asian community. Uh, over 50% of our population um, is from the Asian demographic. The, the population, the next largest population is our Hispanic population, roughly around 25% of our population is, is, is Hispanic, um, followed by the next largest population that we have is our white population, uh, which is in the 12% range of our district population, um, followed by our black population, which is, which is a, a, I roughly have to double check on this, 4% uh, or so, um, and then followed by, you know, smaller percentages of multiracial um, and so on, and, you know, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, very small populations uh, of our other subgroups. Our largest, again, is our Asian, followed by Hispanic, white, um, black and then much smaller subgroups for the others. So so you also see here that there's an 11.5% of responses that uh, chose not to answer. And this um, uh, there's, there's one less response um, in general where uh, someone chose not to answer this question altogether. But this is an area that I would like to frame a recommendation to our SLTs. Um, and I know what I would like to put in the recommendation, but I didn't know if there was anyone else that wanted to kind of look at this data and sort of give some feedback as to um, a recommendation that they would want to make. I have one, Danielle. Sure, Rashmi. 
So this comes from parents who actually were looking into it and understanding. I think if we break down the Asian further, you may be able to get more response because Asian is uh, such a vast uh, majority. Um, if you just uh, further break it down like East Asian to Southeast Asian uh, or Middle Asian, so then people feel more connected to their ethnicity and they may be able to respond. Um, now, so, Gus, I don't, I don't know if, if, I mean, and Mike, I, I mean, because I was, I was a principal in a school where that fell into that category, right? You know, just in terms of culturally responsive as well, there were two, um, ethnicity groups that didn't necessarily reflect my community. One of them was the white group. It was like this vast group that encompassed everything. So, so I looked like I was over 50% white, but I, genuinely wasn't. And then the Asian, I think Rushmi is right, but I don't think Rushmi that for accountability purposes, they break this down any further. And so we could um, talk with schools just about um, for those. Well, here's what I was thinking. And, and I want to know, is there anybody else that, that wanted to, to comment um, before I, I give my input? Um, I'll uh, just mention that uh, these are reflective of uh, federal categories that are used uh, uh, by the U.S. Department of Education that were really put together in the 1960s. Right. Uh, in the 1980s or early 90s, uh, the superintendent of District 30 and I actually were asked by uh, one of the uh, congressional representatives to uh, give input to Congress about how these categories were not reflective of the uh, diversity of Queens communities. Um, uh, the uh, discussion, as I remember it, was that uh, they were used in so many different ways by the federal government, and uh, it was fraught with uh, all kinds of issues to revise them. So, um, so many years later, they remain in place, and they're still uh, not reflective of the diversity of, uh, especially of the borough of Queens. Yep. So I also want to point out that Mike added an other field here, uh, which is why you see here uh, someone typed in Brazilian, and there are some other things in there. And typically, we, w we wouldn't have that. Uh, people are forced to choose one of the categories that that are displayed, just like on the census, right? Right, uh, Gus. Yeah. The um, uh, the um, uh, uh, census. And the Title I uh, categories are reflective of the, you know, federal regulations yeah. across uh, government agencies. Yeah. Right. So, but but Rashmi brings up a good point that maybe individual schools, um, in terms of their their own data for knowing their schools well and knowing their communities well, may want to drill down a little bit more in their survey data, um, in order to get a better picture of. Mm. Um, yeah, and I'm, and I'm not sure if that's why in the biennial review they leave it as an as an other box for people to indicate that other component. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be doing it for that purpose. The, this was modeled very much after yeah. the um, the biennial review uh, tool that we provided. So that may be the reason that they do that. So I mean, you know, here's what I'm thinking in the. Um, you know, in the in service of the work that we are doing with our um, uh, equity teams across the district, in that although there are 12% of our student population, and we could also um, we we also know that there is, um, you know, uh, it's it's much higher for staff, but for families, 12% of our student population is white. But if you look at SLT um, makeups, it is 57, 53.7% of the people who sit on our SLTs are white. So one of the recommendations that I was thinking to um, put down for, uh, for our SLTs is to, you know, work with, um, all constituency groups to ensure that there is communication um, or, you know, to um, 
to make sure that you're taking into consideration that the makeup of your SLT should represent the diversity of your school. So I didn't know how people felt about that, um, just as a recommendation based on the information that we're seeing here. And the uh, the green the green part of the pie chart that, that for, for black is 6.2%, just so you guys know. I know it's not written there. <clears throat> And if I can just make one quick correct correction, we have it's a we're at eleven percent for our white uh, population and twenty seven percent for his, our Hispanic. I think I said twenty five and twelve. So just to give a uh, more accurate numbers. So it's not to say that they have to do it, but our recommendation is to just look at um, the population of your school to to ensure that um, uh, constituency groups may represent um the communities that that are making decisions for the school so um is there anyone opposed to that joe you have your hand danielle? up. Danielle. yep i just wanted to comment but danielle touched upon it so i uh, my comment was is the makeup of the slt is not really indicative of the demographics of our communities correct so that's a you know something that maybe we should target right but then how how are we going to target that? Because that's by election and vote. What if I'm just giving an example? What if in an SLT like on PS24, I'll give that example. If all only one ethnic group parents decided to run and win. So that's what I mean, it trust is. Me, sometimes it's it's really just about talking about it, right? So saying that we recognize that and and okay. ensuring that all of our all the constituencies in our community have access to and have an understanding of um, what SLT is um, and why, and to make sure that they know that these are people that um, are represented to, to represent, are elected to represent their constituencies to make decisions about their school. Andre, I know that you had something to say as well. Yeah, no, I was just gonna, my recommendation would be uh, to have uh, on the SLT DC 37, uh, uh, member as a core constituent. That's my recommendation. A lot of times we don't have that uh, large constituent group uh, on the SLT. So I will say um, in the spirit of um, District 25's love and respect for DC 37, you know that that is um, an initiative that we put in place. We will check that um, and, and, and I think that but for the most part, because of our work with DC 37 on DLT for the past few years, I, I believe, and I'm going to double check, that we have a DC 37 member on all of our SLTs. But I'm not going to speak 100%, but I do know that that is a focus area. So I will include yeah. that. No, we'll include that because I know that they're not based on state. Um, I'll put that down as a recommendation, to, you know, just to have them make sure that they're a member on the SLT. So and just uh, just as a reminder, uh, Andre, um, you brought this up. Uh, uh, I don't recall whether it was this district or another one some time ago, and uh, I um, uh, sent the request up to Sharon Rencher uh, and her team who are working on um, A655 revisions, and I was told at the time that uh, they were going to take that uh, recommendation uh, strongly uh you know under advisement great thank you gus so so i also um you know th there's two things that i want to mention and 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 something that mike and i would put together if people agree so so we're, we're really speaking about um uh communication tools and making sure that the dlt uh, i mean that the slt uh does outreach to all constituencies with the understanding that um, other constituencies may need a little bit more support in understanding the role of the SLT, right? So, for example, so we look at um, that we are 27% Hispanic and 10.5% 10 10 of the makeup of our SLTs is Hispanic, and we are over 50% Asian and only 16.4% of families make up um, the constituencies of um, our SLT. So I'm. I also that leads me to consider: um, Are we translating our communication in a way where um, 
you know, parents, and, and I think this is really more for parents, truly know the role of an SLT and what that means. So, so the other recommendation that I did want to make is to um, request that President's Council um, works with the DLT to support the PTA president on ensuring that there's some sort of workshop where SLT is explained in multiple languages to families. Um, or we could also ask the schools to do that, but um, that could be in conjunction with the, the, um, with the PTAs to just make sure that families understand that what the PTA is. So, I mean, what the SLT is. So, I mean, I've been here 10 years and there's only been one parent who's requested translation during um, their SLT meetings. So, so we want to do more outreach or recommend to DLT SLTs that they do more outreach to make sure that they're reaching families. And that includes um, parents that speak languages other than English. So is there <laughs> objection to that? No, uh, Danielle, it's so no, no objection. It's so funny that you bring that because last week we had a president council's board meeting and that's one of the things that I was going to bring it on the table. It's like you just read my mind that a lot of parents are asking help to understand what an SLT is and what's their role in an SLT and what they can bring and what SLT can do for the community because it looks like parents are not 100% aware or even if they are with so many changes, they kind of want to get reminded of how important SLT is at the school level. So yes, we are very much uh, in support of setting some kind of training or like, hey, look, a notice workshop for parents to understand. Um, because some parents, you will be surprised, they don't even know that SLT is is uh, open meetings law so anybody and everybody can attend so when i i um forward the slt meeting notice to my constituents they get really shocked there's like what uh we can attend uh what if if i don't speak in this language not and it's not specific to one school that's the general uh, sense lately we are getting I, I am getting since i've been in the pta and president council i don't know how it was last year or the year before but recently, that's what we are encountering. So I totally 100% support what you're saying. Okay, thank you, Rashmi. Anyone else? So from this, um, from this one piece, we want to frame a guidance document. And, and Dr. Danton and I will have this for you guys. And we'll we'll put this together. You know, just around um, communication to all constituencies in multiple languages, um, and um, you know, engaging in support and activities with uh, school-based PTAs. So um, to advocate for um, SLT representation that um, mirrors the um, the uh, race and ethnicity group of their communities. So that, that would be the recommendation. I think you okay. should also um, point out that there is translation, right? So the parents understand they'll, they'll they will have translation at the SLT, right? So utilized uh, the translation unit and the district, we can say. Um, for support, right, and, and communicate that as well, right? Because Jin May was the one that went to the DLT meetings and, and translated for the that parent. Um, OK, so so I think that's that's uh, some good feedback to give to uh, around this question. Um, all right, so the next one is around languages spoken at home. And I think this is um, kind of indicative of what we were saying. Um, and not to say that um, it won't look like this again in two years, but really to talk about um, making sure that if there are families who do not speak English at home, that they know, Gus, I mean, uh, Joe, like you just said, that they know that there's translations available to them and that it would not exclude them from being on the SLT. So these two questions are are similar. OK, um, the response is a school title one status. So we have, um, I believe, Gus, it's 24 schools that are um, title one. This I found to be really interesting, but <laughs> sounds about right. Yeah. So 93 and almost 94 percent of the responses came from um, SLTs of title one schools. OK. So here it says CEP goals are outlined and developed by members of SLT collaboratively. 
Um, so I just want to, you know, I'll take a moment for you guys to look at this and then see if you have any feedback around that. So, so one of the things that, that we know from um, prior years in DLT is that this was an issue in one of our high schools a few years ago. So we want to be clear to our SLTs. A lot of SLTs have a culture very similar to our DLT, right? Our DLT is we uh, bring up some data points and we show you data points and we give you sample goals by which we build from as a DLT, right? Um, that is our culture. However, the expectation, just so everyone knows, is that the consensus of the group is that CEP goals are developed collaboratively as a team, right? So sometimes, and, and this is where we're seeing this here, although 71% is a good number to feel that way, and it is higher than it has been, um, the fact that 25% of certain constituencies um, are saying that that doesn't happen is something that I would like to give um, guidance to our SLTs. Like ensure there is a collaborative process um, for goal development um, where constituencies have input from uh, pre-goal writing, right? If they choose. And if not, um, that they understand that very similarly to you guys understanding that, right? So. So if anybody on this team says, you know what, before you write the goals and you're looking at data, I want to be part of the process or we want the team to be part of the process, that's absolutely fine. Um, but if we prefer as a team to, to allow one person to kind of craft the goals and then present them and we agree on them, then then this, this response should be higher. Do you see what I'm saying? Like people should say, even though we don't do it collaboratively, we have a culture that says that. So to just review that. Um, all right. So, okay. Does everybody agree, disagree? Danielle, looking at these results, uh, the way I, I understand them is you're saying 71% strongly agree on the collaborative process and then 25.2% um, agree so uh, in my mind, you're adding the 71% to the 25.2, and uh, it's only the uh, smaller slices that um, uh, are um, a negative in terms of collaboration. Correct, Gus. You know, okay. well, one of so the things, right. That's, so one that's of the, the majority, that, yeah, yeah, the overwhelming majority, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's where I'm saying, um, So we'd say, um, I want to say, ensure there's communi communication around the collaborative process, um, and then to discuss the difference between strongly agreeing and agreeing, because that's the thing. If if I feel like I'm part of the process, I'm going to write strongly agree. So to maybe just engage in that conversation between that, because that's a lot of in District 25, because we have communities that really support our schools they don't want to answer negatively. So that's where you see the difference between agree and strongly agree. So to just check that, to make sure that, because um, there's no reason why if part of a, a school's culture is creating CEP goals um, and outlining and developing them by with members collaboratively, then people wouldn't say they strongly agree. Do you know what I'm, do you get what I'm saying? So to just say to, so just touch base on that, to touch, you know, make sure that's part of a discussion at your SLT to go over this and, and we'll give this to them, right? We're going to give them the responses and then give them like the feedback piece. So to go over this and say like, so we want to talk about this slide to make sure that everyone is aware of the process and our SLT culture around goal development. What do you think? No, Gus? No, I think that's a good idea, uh, but um, uh, the way I view it is uh, it is a positive result. It's not yes. as if uh, the uh, 
strongly disagree and the disagree uh, and neither disagree or disagree category is 25 percent, right. which is, you know, uh, something that I've seen elsewhere in the city. And we love Gus. He's always flattering to us. Thank you, Gus. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and typically, typically on the Likert scale, we want it to be on the on the uh, agree and strongly agree side. That's typically well, what you're going to see. On, I mean, you're you're going to see that for both of our questions. Yeah. For most of our questions are going to be that way, and that's where we say, um, if I'm on the SLT, I don't want my school to look bad. And this is just my thinking. I don't know if anybody else thinks this way. So. If I don't, I'm either going to write strongly agree for everything. And if there's an issue where I go, oh, you know, I think we should look at that a little bit. I'm not going to put disagree. Right. Um, so so I think that's a piece that we should look at as a district, because here's this too: academic programs utilized in the school are explained. Um, the fact that 26 percent said agree, maybe it could be because they might be explained, but they don't understand them. So all we're going to say is to take this question to ensure that there's feedback, you know, and an understanding around. So so here's how we explain academic programs. And and are we all on the same page with that? Do you know what I'm saying? OK, anybody disagree? Want to add? I'm doing this by myself. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to add something, um, Danielle. Remember when we traditionally do the um, 100.11 uh, plan review, um, the survey is an important component, maybe the major component, but one thing I always say is that uh, you also have a system in place where individual DLT members gather information based on their uh, act or interactions with uh, schools and SLTs as liaisons. Mm -hmm. And so that's a second, um, you know, way of gathering information and um, maybe refining or adding to the results uh, of the survey, whether it's a central survey or your own survey. OK, perfect. Thank you, Gus. Um, so. What do we think about this one? All right, so here's here's the feedback that I put in place. Taking into consideration these two slides, nine and 10, I put discuss the process the SLT engages in um, to dis, uh, that where they discuss and evaluate academic programs and ensure there's clarity around those those uh, systems. Yes, no. Yeah, I mean, I I think that this um, this particular uh, you know pie chart, if you look at the slice that on the three, uh, I would call them uh, less positive. Uh, pieces of the pie chart, uh, it's larger than any of the others. And so the answer to this question obviously is something that would uh, require some attention. And what I'm looking at, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Joe. What I'm looking at is what are the structures? I don't, I don't, I wouldn't know how to answer this because I don't know what the structures are. You know what? I mean, we could we could ensure that that is discussed at SLTs, right? Because every school um, has a, a way that they sh are evaluating whether or not their academic program is appropriate for their students, right? And so, yeah, and, and it includes it in the question surveys for teachers, parents, students, informal and formal assessment data. So, if there's not a way for for an SLT to do that. I think it's kind of in indicative, you know, the, the whole idea, of, you know, even 10 percent of people saying neither or disagree is is certainly something that raises a flag that, um, you know, that there's there's more work to be done there, even with that subgroup. And, you know, connecting that to just the agree, if 35 percent of the population that completed the survey are indicating, 
you know, that there's more room to grow. Yep. Okay. Any, any more uh, input on this one? Okay. Um, so, Mike, you want to go through this a little bit? Because I get flustered with these bar graphs. <laughs> Yeah, so it's basically just indicating there was a question about, you know, what what issues are discussed at SLT. The the ones that you see the most uh, the the bar graphs um, that are that are most visible are ones that were already in the check down box for people to to indicate all the others below that are things that were write ins. Um, so the, the one with the largest percentage of uh, of discussion is social emotional learning was a was an area that is discussed routinely uh it seems at, at our slts um parent engagement and involvement and 95 percent of our of our conversations at slt that you know so you know there's there is a wide range of things that are being discussed which is important because you know that tells me that it's not just about a goal it's about multiple goals that the school is is talking about inclusive of subgroups that um, have been identified in, in so much so as the special education, L population, you know, you can see where it is that the uh, that school leadership teams have focused most of their energy and it is inside of the areas that, you know, we would want them to be discussing. So um, there is some evidence there that that um, the focus areas are connected to district wide goals as well. I have a quiet comment. So it you see how this could be related to the prior uh, slide because if we're not discussing the academic programs as much as all these other topics, you're really not going to get an accurate response on the other on the other slide, right? The programs are what less than one percent, point three percent. Yeah. So maybe you need to, you know, bring in more about the academic programs to the SLT. Um, you know, I, I I agree, and I'm glad that you saw that. I would want um, I would want to have them look at because if you see instruction, it says they 80% of them talk about instruction, right? But they don't mention um, curriculum, right? And that that I think is is both, right? So we need to talk about curriculum and instruction. So bring that to the table. How often are you discussing that, right? I'm going to add that. Um, you know what concerns me also, um, and Gus agree with me, as part of our training, one of the things that we've always said to SOPs is that budget needs to be part of their discussion at every meeting, right? Just in terms of spending money, um, you know, is our budget being um, utilized in the way in alignment to our goals? Um, I was very... Um, taken back by how little budget is discussed at, um, you know, in, in terms of this, because educational curriculum and instruction is where a lot of our money is spent, right? So, so yeah, but the only thing I would say there, Danielle, is that you know, well, I mean, I guess I, I guess we can consider, um, you know, budget and educational issue. I just don't know that it was kind of a, it wasn't a drop down in here. It wasn't one of the elements that they would, would include um, as, a, you know, so in other words, it wasn't one of the check boxes. And I think sometimes when, when they're looking at the others as in terms of educational issues, they might not correlate those as being a choice. You know, I don't, you know what I mean? Right. So it may, if it was an added and then another added box in there, it might have been it might have been more prevalent in in the responses from the folks that completed it. OK, um, but either way, I'd want to add that into our recommendation where we're including to speak about educational issues in multi tiered, which would include spending of the budget, right, which is part of the action plans of the CEP. You, you might want to say something like budget slash um, educational resources, uh, you know, uh, because it's not just about the dollars. It's about the resources that are applied uh, to the instructional program, sort of broadly defined. Uh, so, um, you know, people aren't only gravitating towards the numbers in Galaxy, but, you know, um, anything else 
uh, that um, and and the instructional category, um, to my mind, should be the largest category because remember the focus of SLTs is the CEP, which is the um, the, the uh, instructional blueprint of the whole school. So um, really instruction uh, should be, uh, you know, not that everything else is not important and related to it, but it really is the key focus of uh, the SLT and should always be the key focus of uh, the SLT. I Academic we'll that. And, yeah, and we'll include schools. that in our feedback. Okay, I like the way you said that. Okay. Okay. Um. So. And Danielle, I, uh, in terms of instruction, you might want to combine it with a concept of uh, academic improvement because it's instruction but also, you know, getting better every year, um, adding new things, uh, targeting, you know, the needs of students. So uh, it's instruction and academic improvement. That's why, uh, you know, we always uh, call the uh, CEP uh, a, um, you know, school improvement plan in, in, in addition just to an educational plan. You know, um, but I also find, um, and, and Gus, I'm glad you pointed this out. So, so, I, I liked what Mike was talking about in terms of our one of our goals has to do with parent involvement and engagement in social emotional learning and we want that to be part of it. But then we go to um, what Joe said as well that instruction should be equal to if not higher than and Gus you said this too than those areas and it is not. So I think one of our um, push for SLTs is to make sure they come back to that. Like how often is instruction part of the work that you're doing as an SLT to check um, around the implementation of goals and action plans that deal with that? Because um, let's face it, you know, you do have um, attendance goals, you do have social emotional goals, but you also have other goals as well that are um, academic and, you know, uh, teaching and learning based. And so so you wouldn't want to see, and here it's a little bit better than it was in the other slide, but you wouldn't want to see there to be any less talk of instruction than you're talking about parent involvement. And that may be something that we check for our SLTs that like, do you leave instruction to the school or do you talk about it at SLT, right? And so I think that's a good segue, you know, to just kind of surface that to go through this with, um, you know, these answers, you know, aligned with our, um, you know, our feedback document, you know, to give them the tools to do that, to just say, like, this is something they don't have to, but something that the DLT put together. Um, here's our feedback to you, and here's the, the corresponding results of the survey, right? Maybe you want to go through this with your DL, your SLTs. Is everybody okay with that? It also relates to what uh, Joe uh, highlighted earlier in terms of structures. I mean, the the structures that are put in place related to instruction, uh, related to the CEP and the SLT planning process are really the uh, key uh, elements here. That's why progress monitoring is so important. And um, that's one thing that the district, uh, uh, su the, the superintendent's team does, is when you go into schools, you're looking at what are the structures that the schools have in place uh, in, in, in order to improve instruction and uh, meet student needs and academic goals. Uh, isn't that isn't that you know uh, the focus of the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, all right. So, so we'll craft something around that. I, I I found those questions to be very interesting, but see. This is also what I wanted to talk about in terms of strongly agree and agree. And I hear what you're saying, Gus, that it looks really good with us, but either you're developing bylaws that comply with A655 or you're not. And for people who love their school, they might not want to say neither agree or disagree. So they're saying agree, but this number should definitely be higher in terms of strongly agree, right? Because if bylaws are part of their work, we go over our bylaws, I wouldn't expect 
people to say agree when we've spent time, you know, unpacking our bylaws together as a DLT. So that might be something that the school should just kind of, you know, reinforce, right? Or no? I think you're right, yeah. I, I agree with uh, Danielle too, because a lot of people, like a lot of parents who doesn't have the such subject matter expertise on these um, areas would start to understand it better if we start from the core where the bylaws are just to understand do's and don'ts and then like start unpacking it from there. So I, I do agree. All right, so we'll mention that. Thank you, Rashmi. Okay. Um, I mean, equal number of parents and staff. 78 yeah this is this is about um this is a compliance question right this has to this is part of um a requirement so if there's a, a school that may need to to balance that this is just about balance um now once again you see how this changes a little bit SLT addresses a component of CEP as an agenda item at every meeting. Um, anybody want to give feedback on this one? Like, I'm, I'm very worried about when they say neither agree or disagree. What does that mean? Does that can we can we further like try to understand to see? Does that mean that that SLT team is not maybe they are uh, unpacking CEP goals at that level, but they're not, it's not clear. So members don't understand that. Um, I don't know. So we're, I'm going to put that down in there. So we just say ensure that areas, CEP areas, um, are addressed at every meeting and, uh, clearly highlighted or articulated to and articulated to SLT members, right? It's all right. So far, we only have seven uh, points, so it's not like we're going to be overwhelming them, right? <laughs> um, so what do we say about this? You guys are a tough crowd today. <laughs> tough crowd. Pie, pie charts sometimes do that to you, I think, Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, anywhere, anytime there's a neither agree or disagree, I typically always take it as room for growth. There needs to be further, um, further guidance provided. And, you know, oftentimes you'll see someone puts neither agree or disagree because they don't want to be negative and put it in, in the, dis the disagree or strongly disagree. But I, I connect them into the same category uh, when those mm -hmm. things uh, look like that. So for this too, I think um, one of the things that we might ask uh, SLTs to revisit is assessments and evaluations of goals, right? Or assessments and evaluations that are happening at the school level. Um, because that is at 62%, and especially now in February, we're supposed to be doing our benchmarking. We wanna make sure that um, the expectation of consistently reviewing um, progress of CEP goals is part of the work of the SLT. And it's something that you've pointed out already, Danielle, uh, that uh, the budget slash resources slice is very small and really uh, should be part of the discussion of uh, the other items. Yep. Anybody else? No, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the positive component to this and in, in these these important questions is and I know that we would much rather be strongly agree, but I think you know, 95% plus in, in many of these categories is is a positive sign. 
Yes, agreed. And I want to say that I'm not saying, you know, one of the things that I, you know, Gus had pointed out too, I'm not saying our data doesn't look good. Our data looks great. But, you know, there's opportunities for discussion of these points. And what we don't want is for a lot of people to say, oh, the data looks great. And so we, it's not an issue for us. We just want to ask them to check, right? Like, look at this slide. And although this is very high, and, and we'll go over this with principals, um, although the, this data is really good, we just want to do a check to make sure and then kind of address it. So everybody answers 100% agree. Or strongly. Daniel, Mike, uh, I have a question. Uh, in, in terms of Title I and Title I resources, where do you see uh, the uh, focus on, you know, the the uh, academic improvement for students most in need and the use of Title I resources figuring into the this data and, you know, these responses? That's a good question, Gus, because we don't see <laughs> I mean, you didn't break it out. You don't yeah, necessarily yeah, I mean, have look, to break it out. It is but part it, of instructional program right? discussion. It's part of instructional program. And it's part of budget, which is concerning in itself, right? So so I, I agree. Um, but this, this I, we can incorporate that to make sure that for Title I schools. Um, but look at this one. This one is very interesting to me because we've spent a lot of time talking about this, about how constituencies communicate to their respective constituencies, right? So, um, so any feedback from, from this one? I don't understand what uh, how you're splitting up public meetings. You have 30.1 and then under that you have 19.2. What does that mean? You see that? Where? I'm looking the uh, three down from the top, right? You see public meetings has two bars there. Mm -hmm. What is that based on? Oh, Mike, can you? Hold on, I'm going. Hold on. Yeah, there was there was a question that had to be adjusted in in process. This might be one of them. So, uh, hold on, five, seventeen. Hold on. So the the one that's missing, that's nineteen point one percent, is uh, the title, and that was UFT chapter leaders report. I'm not sure why it didn't show in the in the image. <clears throat> so U of T chapter leaders report received 55 responses, which is 19.1% of all responses. Got it. Thanks. And again, all these bar graphs, and I think we mentioned it before, they selected uh, all that apply, right, Mike, or no? Uh, yeah, for a lot of the drop downs, it's it's check more than one or there's right. another feature. Anytime there's an other feature, it creates lots of those little slices. Um, and you can see one person basically entered each one because they typed it in. OK. So. This one. And God, here again is where I say to you, because he's going to say positive things about their schools, you can still look between agree and strongly agree at the differences in what they're saying, right? So. SLT as a whole discusses and makes data driven amendments to CEP. Um, what would we want to say to SLTs about this data? <laughs> I 
Okay, I know what to say. I'll write that one. <laughs> um, okay, SLT treats the CEP as a living document um, and realigns the documents with priorities as needed. I'll, I'll include both of these slides together in, um, in a recommendation. But what I think is um, interesting is like, although they're different, they're also similar, like data-driven amendments and treating the CEP as a living document and amends and realigns. This is, um, the strongly agree is a lot higher in the second question than it is in the first. I thought that was just an interesting. Uh, uh, on the on the data issue, uh, Danielle, um, uh, I'm sure you'll remember a, a number of years ago because I was involved in the initial rollout. Um, uh, it was mandated that every school have what was called an inquiry team. I don't know whether those inquiry teams uh, really exist in a formal way anymore, but um, to my mind, someone on the SLT should always be um, collaborating with the, you know, with the administration, the principal to keep their finger on data and um, uh, be able to update the team in terms of, uh, you know, the, the data uh, for uh, the uh, CP goals and the progress monitoring on an um, on an ongoing basis. Um, if I were designing, you know, um, uh, SLTs, I would have that as sort of a uh, a common position uh, or, you know, in a, in a formal sense on every SLT. So um, there's always, you know, someone uh, who's uh, who's following the data and informing the other members of what the data shows. Yep. Yes, and I, actually I'm going to put that. Who's the data point on your SLT and is there time allotted to discuss data? Yeah, I think that the idea are the agenda items. Do we have these things as agenda items? Many of them are connected. You know, it's just a matter of whether or not they're actual agenda items. You know what I think is interesting too, um, that I want to include. If you look at this, um, how uh, uh, ESSA and subgroup data, the the low is lower than the rest. I'm happy to see that ELA and math benchmark assessments are discussed. Um, I'm happy to see that chronic absenteeism reports are discussed. Um, you know, although lower, but but ELA benchmark assessments are addressed. But um, to really talk a little bit about um, ESSA data and subgroup data, I think that's important because that really um, is work that Dr. Gantona and I have been doing with our schools around um, making sure that they understand that ESSA data and that it's part of their uh, CEP. So, and you know what, Danielle, is something that I can probably drill down further is to see how many of our parents indicated that the ESSA data points are communicated about, or is it coming from, you know, our teachers and, uh, and administrators? So it could be broken down a little bit further to get us, give us a little bit more insight as to who's saying what. Yeah. So this, I'm just going to add in the question, ensure that ESSA and subgroup data is shared and discussed at, um, uh, SLT, because look here, here you have it again, right? Um, <laughs> ELA math benchmark assessments um, are higher than chronic absenteeism reports and parent surveys, but look at where you have ESSA data and subgroup data, right? So we should, um, that's a recommendation. Um, same thing about, you know, just to go over this question about that's where we said, um, who is the data point in SLT and is there time allocated in your agenda items? That's really part of this. Um, uh, SLT uh, records, it looks like they're good, right? Even though we would want that a little higher, but that's good. It should be you have it or you don't. Um, now look at this. So Danielle, I, you, you went, uh, you're on uh, slide 24, right? Y yep. So the, the how often I think is interesting. How often do you review? And that might connect to okay. some of those other questions. You want me to go how back? Often, say again? You want me to go back to 22? Yeah, it's just it's just an interesting piece. So you have 10% say they do it every two months. 22% of respondents say that they do that 
um, every three months, and then five percent say that they do it, you know, twice per year. You know, so it's just you know there's a there's a range, um, you know, a pretty big range there. Twenty percent of schools are not necessarily doing that every month. So it can kind of lend itself to why some of those questions were also ranked the way that they were. Okay, so now going back to this. Um, once again, this is also part of um, benchmarking and monitoring, right? I think this looks aligned with what we were looking earlier in these um, pie charts about making our communication more effective to the school community and making them understand uh, what exactly is CEP and how strong that goal can be for a school. I think parents don't really grasp that, but yeah, you already, I think, have that on your agenda to say. Yeah. Um, and Rashmi, maybe this is something that you can talk to uh, PTA presidents about around how often do you as PTA presidents speak to your constituencies around progress and effectiveness of the CEP? Okay. There really is an important element, uh, Danielle, because I, uh, what it reminds me of is when I've uh, gone on um, uh, school uh, visits throughout the city, uh, with the state, uh, one of the questions that they would, uh, you know, they would meet with the various groups in uh, a, uh, a school building. They would always ask the parents, uh, have you seen the CEP? What do you know about your CEP? What about the CEP goals, etc.? And very often, more often than uh, I would like to see, the parents would say, uh, you know, I've never seen the CEP or I don't know anything about it or uh, I'm not sure what the goals are, that kind of thing. Right. Yep. And so, I think it's it's still it's still a reality a little bit. Um, not a little bit, it's a little bit more. So I'll put that for next president's council. I'll bring that to my board meeting. I think we all will agree. Um, I'll try to do something in terms of CEP and transparencies around it. Yeah, I mean, and I think the 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 focus, Rashmi, just as a recommendation should be. Um, around how they communicate it to parents, right? So, so you know, this the our recommendations from DLT will go to SLTs around these bullet points that I will put together for our next meeting. But for President's Council, it's around: Do our parents know what is happening? Not just actually, I'm taking that back. Not just what's happening at SLT meetings, but the progress of the C goals and action plans around what and what's happening across the year. So, um, okay. Um, so this one, this piece is really good, right? Gus, we weren't here years ago. So, right. you know, this, this I'm very proud of around the team it making. Should be. Yep. So um, I'm really happy to see this. So um, SLT bylaws include a process where the teams engage it. Well, we talked about this earlier, where that's going to be part of a recommendation that we make. Um, I have a quick question, real quick. Yep. The two questions prior about how they make their decisions, the one that you just showed up that you just spoke on, is there anything to do for the groups that says majority, since me decisions are supposed to be a consensus? Is there anything to address about the ones that say majority? Um, we can put that in as a, a piece to say that it, this should really be 100% consensus, right? Yeah. Nobody's voting. That's the way I always put it. It's not a yeah. vote. Okay, we'll add that. Thanks, Lamar. Okay. Um, and then SLT bylaws, we said that we're going to to mention them in, in general. Um, but this is also about... Uh, resolving issues. I, I think you, we can have them ask about this, but we've gone over this process about resolving conflicts um, and just ask them to review it. Um, disputes and conflicts are resolved internally. We can actually just ask for them to go over that process, but that's part of their training, right? They may have been, maybe if we gave our survey a little earlier after, as they were going through the training, Gus, they would have answered differently. We don't know. Um, okay, look at this one.
I think this is up. more. Of a, this is higher. This is a more of a question. Uh, you know, uh, information for us. I will say to you, still very <laughs> good because I think we've done, like as Gus said, um, you know, almost ninety over ninety percent. However. Um, you know, we might want to think about once again, like we do have assignments of SLT members to schools. We might want to think about, you know, continuing to move forward and, and doing individual DLT outreach. I mean, I know we do our, our yearly training this year. We didn't do it, but most certainly um, I want to continue to do that. So our SLT see us as a unit and know that we're here as a resource. Um, so uh, Danielle, just a quick question on the last slide, the, the previous slide, the 29. So if the question would have been if SLT members are aware and utilize DLT as an available source, do you think that the 62% could have changed to a lower percentile instead of just being aware and or being aware and utilizing? Correct, but, but here's, here's what I will say to that question. So, um, you know, we as a DLT, we want to make sure that we are not micromanaging our SLTs, right? We want them to be a decision-making body. Um, I think so if you use and utilize, it would definitely be lower, but it, I don't know if that would be a proper way to gather data, right? Because the DLT is not involved in the decision making of SLTs like we do our district level work they do their school based work we really resolve um, and support with training um, and we also support with um, when they can't um, they have issues making decisions so um, I don't know if if I would you know as long as they know that what we do and maybe we could think about framing I mean this is a a question that we took directly from Central, but I don't know if, like I would say, yeah, I know the DLT is there, but I don't really need them right now. So I don't know. It would definitely be lower, but I don't know if that's the kind of data that we, um, to say and utilize, right? I don't know. Just something to think about. Mm. Okay. Um, this one's important, Gus. What do you want to say about that? <laughs> State and federal requirements. Again, uh, uh, needs to be higher. The um, neither agree nor disagree slice is uh, too large for my. Uh, this is the highest. This is the the you know the highest out of all the data. So, so we want to say something about state and federal requirements. If if DLT if SLTs don't know about state and federal requirements such as ESSA, see this is aligned to ESSA. Right. Um, then we need they need to revisit that. And Gus, we're going to put you as a resource. That's fine. That's what I do. <laughs> OK, all right. And then look at that. That's very rainbowy. <laughs> well, in fairness, we just did our, you know, our packs. So so we're hoping next year this will get better. But once again, we'll we'll make um, a recommendation to ensure for Title One schools. That, that SLT is meeting with PAC, right? Is that a requirement, Gus? Uh, I, I don't think uh, uh, SLT members of the Title I PAC. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure whether a monthly meeting is mandated or not. I would have to look at what uh, the uh, regulations uh, say. Probably it is because, um, you know, the uh, SLT is supposed to meet every month. Yeah. And um, the uh, communication is supposed to flow back and forth. So I would think that it should be a meeting uh, every month uh, as well. Uh, going back to the previous slide uh, on federal and state regulations, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a comment that uh, recently, as uh, the, the, the both of you know, um, the, um, the state came out with report cards uh, for schools and districts. Uh, every school, uh, Every school's SLT uh, should be aware of that uh, report card. The data in it is not uh, the most current. Often the the and they should the SLT should have more updated data than is in that uh, state report card. But because uh, accountability requirements uh, can um, uh, 
you know, sort of come back to bite a school with, uh, with, without their being aware of it, they should always track and use that report card to know what the, the state um, is, um, is um, tracking in terms of their particular school. Correct. Yeah, yeah, so just so you know, those small slices, it's a lot, it's a huge range of either not sure or not, no longer Title I school. You'll see a lot of, you know, a lot of those types of comments were made, which is why you see the rainbow there. Yep. Now, look at this one. So, um, this is more of a DLT issue, Gus, we can say, right? Yeah, because Absolutely. We just worked on the DPIP and we're working on communicating it to schools. So, um, you know, this is something that I will uh, communicate with principals. But the DPIP, which is our parent involvement policy that I just spoke about in the beginning of the meeting that we sent to be um, translated, it is supposed to be used to align as a, as a guide to the schools, uh, each school's parent involvement policy. And we have a lot of people saying they're not sure, almost, you know, 49, almost 49%. So, so that's something that we need to work on as a DLT. And I'll make sure once that um, is completed that that's sent out to um, SLTs and that it's discussed as an agenda item on SLTs, that when they do their PIP, they should use the P DPIP as guidance, right? And, and um, it's also very closely related to the DCP. Uh, I had the experience of uh, having to prep uh, schools uh, for state visits. And one of the things that the state would ask when they visited a school is, are you um, and your SLT aware of your um, DCP plan at the district level? So I would take a copy of the DCP with me and make sure that the principal had a copy of it and didn't say, oh, I've never seen it or, you know, I don't know what it consists of. Because remember, the DCP, just like the, the DPIP, are supposed to be models and information that flows into individual schools CEPs. Yep. Perfect. So so that's that I, is something I will work on for us, too. Um, and. You know, we'll just continue to do this. I, you know, I like that our SLTs are saying that 70% of the training offered is offered by the district. Um, I also like to see, I mean, we can do this higher as well, but 58, um, almost, you know, 58 and a half percent is coming from the school. Um, and then uh, Central one is, is probably because we gave this to them when Central was um, presenting. <laughs> so, um, I also like that they're saying 94% is on uh, roles and responsibilities. Um, and we want to get uh, that number, even though it is very high, it's 88%, but we just want um, our SLT members to understand that training should be in the CEP. And I'm thinking based on this data that our next training for our SLTs should be very CEP focused, if you guys agree. Okay, now that I have completely bored all of you, I, I, I think this is really interesting stuff, but now I can tell if I were a teacher, this would be an ineffective rating, just so you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, like I said, we want, we do want to engage in consultation with you guys before we um, create this document. So if you have any other recommendations that you want to put in the document, you can always email me. But Dr. Mike and I will put this together for our next meeting. And if everyone is in agreement, we will send the data and the document to all of our SLTs and ask them to review it at their April or May meeting. Any questions, concerns, comments? Nope. Okay. Good so, job, District 25. No, this was a boring meeting. Um, <laughs> no, I mean the survey... Uh, is uh, very rich in information. And I'm getting blinded by the sun that keeps hitting my face. So, um, okay, uh, any new business? Any questions, concerns, new business? All right, then can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? I motion. Thank I'll you, make Ryan. the motion. I'm oh, sorry. So can you second, Joe?
Joe, can you second? Is that a, is you okay for you to second? Uh, yes, I'm having. I second the motion. Thank can you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we heard you. So rush me. Uh, motion and and Joe second. Okay. Um, our next meeting. I'm sorry, I'm, I have the screen. Does uh, Lewis, you have the the list of the next meeting date? Yes, I do. Our next meeting is on Monday, March eighth at nine a.m. Okay. All right, guys, so I'll send you um, the information for that meeting um, the, the week before, okay? Um, and have a great, I, I can't even say have a great month because everybody I'm looking at at the screen, I'm going to see you more. So um, have a great day and, and we'll talk soon. Okay. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Care, everyone. Lamar, I'm going to call safe. you, okay? Bye-bye.